So a couple months ago, Stephen and I were talking about doing a LA trip. Mm -hmm. And you used to live in Los Angeles and you used to go to like all the cool spots. And you're like, Ray, we should do a trip where we'll go down and you'll show me where you live. And we'll go to some of the places that that you used to go to. Like trip like, down memory lane. A trip down memory lane for you and yeah. stuff like that. And we're saying like, oh, if we're gonna go down there, we should try to reach out to Clifton's and see maybe we can do an interview with them. Maybe we can interview with someone from there. Because we did a we did an episode on essentially the history of Clifton's through tiki mugs. Mm -hmm. And what I what we did is we sent Clifton's. I mean, I literally just sent them like an email, like info at the well, the Neverlands. That that's that's what their their company's called. Like, hey, we're coming now. We'd like to do an interview with somebody. And you linked to the where we talked about the mugs yeah. and the history yeah, of was, Clifton's. Yeah, we sent the video, and then they got back to us. Yeah, I thought, you know, well, it, we'd interview like like a bar manager, even a head bartender or something like that. Well, we ended up interviewing the owner of Clifton's. Well, the new owner of Clifton's. Mm -hmm. He is the guy who took it over from the original Clifton's family. I think, and he, he, he bought it a couple of years ago, right? Like, Yeah. Uh, uh, he'll tell us in the video, but uh, um, less than 10 years ago. Yeah. And um, uh, Andrew Myron. And he... Um, he will appreciate that you got his name right. Because <laughs> he, he was saying everyone can't, doesn't know how to get his name right. I'm glad you said it on me because I'm sure I would have messed it up. But we entered. Well, we may get an email from him saying I screwed it up anyway. <laughs> well, guys, that's not actually how you say it. But we interviewed the, the literally the new owner of Clifton's. And, um, and we talk about the changes and the things that he did to that place. And I. I didn't realize what Clifton's was and then what it became. And, oh my God. Mm -hmm. And this is a, this is truly a magical place. And, um, for this interview, we're going to learn a lot about the history of Clifton's and what, and what Andrew did to bring it up to what it is now. Yeah. And what I really didn't appreciate was the attention to detail. <laughs> when you build a total environment, all the little things add up. Yeah. Uh, you may not consciously know that the boat in the middle of the tiki bar is from 1935, the year that uh, one of the original cafeterias opened. Mm -hmm. But you, if you appreciate history, you'll subconsciously know that it's a period piece yep. and that there's an art deco bar behind it that's beautiful. And these sort of little details that you, um, that and thought that he and his team put into each little detail just adds up to a spectacular experience, even if consciously you don't know what each detail means or why it's there. But it's, um, and uh, frankly, Andrew off camera afterwards was gracious enough to take us through some of those details and a tour. Um, and um, he and I uh, coined a phrase, um, uh, an oxymoron, authentic fantasy. Authentic fantasy. And, you know, my obsession with a total environment yeah. and this escapism, it's authentic in terms of details and what you're doing, but it's not a real place. It's a fantasy con yeah. concept. And uh, again, it's an oxymoron, but it's an authentic fantasy is, is what Clifton's represents. Uh, it's what a lot of the great tiki bars represent too. And Andrew was kind enough to share with us some of his secrets and plans for the future for 2022, uh, the year 2022, knock on wood, everything goes well, and they fully reopen all the bars and all the concepts he have. Mm -hmm. And Ray and I are going to keep most of those secrets, but <laughs> at the end of the video, we're going to see one of the secrets, uh, one of the new plans, which is a model of the old Pacific Seas the pre-tiki cafeteria environment torn down in the 60s, a beautiful, colorful model encased in a radio. Ray was privileged to play around with that radio. It's a lot of fun. So sticking around for that as well, it, it'll be great. Yeah, wait for your, you're gonna love my facial expressions. So stick around to the end of the video and you're gonna get a treat. Yeah. Now here's our interview with, with Andrew. What's his last name? Myron. Myron.
today we are in downtown Los Angeles at Clifton's and our guest is Andrew and Andrew can you tell the people out there who you are and what you are uh, that's a, a long interesting question um, yeah. basically I uh, create fantasy themed environments I, I work with fantasy hospitality um, and the restoration and rehabilitation of historic properties so um, I take different eras and different buildings and different venues that have been uh, sort of seen better days and are more forlorn and I take them and reinvent them, reinvigorate them, bring them into new audiences and hopefully take them into the future uh, for new generations. So we're in Clifton. This place has been around, when did it? Well the building 1904 to 1906 but 1931 I think Cliff Clinton took it over. Yep, and he bought the lease um, originally in 1931. He reopened as uh, Clifton's Brookdale in 1932. Yeah. And 1935, he really completed the restoration of yeah. what we, we know as Clifton's. biggest cafeteria. And that what, that is what it is, or was, a cafeteria. Yes. Food, right? Yes. And anyway, I saw this Hulhauser episode. And he goes to Clifton's. And the Clifton's in that video is not what this is. I mean, I couldn't believe it was the same place. It just looked kind of like a, like a, like a like a cafeteria, but not really all that cool. How how did you how did you take this over? Like, did you have a vision to like, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and you'd maintain the integrity of the of the space though too. Yeah, I and mean, the idea was to restore what the original was, uh, to maintain the integrity of the original vision, and then yeah. be inspired by the original vision and expand upon it. So uh, initially, the idea was, um, you know, restore the cafeteria. Um, add some additional amenities because times had changed, demographics had changed, economics yeah. had changed. So it wasn't exactly a viable business model. Um, so it was slowly, you know, going downhill over yeah. many decades. And in order to sort of stem the tide um, and change that, it, it really had to be brought into modern audiences and sensibilities on, on some level. But the integrity of the uh, original and the authenticity of the original was what I wanted to maintain. So and you did that? I appreciate that because it, it's been a, a very hard balancing act um, yeah. because uh, everybody has sort of taken ownership of Clifton's over the generations. So you get it from all sides and as a manner of speaking, people want it to look the way it looked at a certain era, people who want you to go further. Um, I think you've hit all the right notes in terms of decor with each of the spaces, but that's my personal bias. There's been a lot of interesting choices that have gone along the way. Um, for example, each person you know feels what's the authentic Clifton's, and Clifton's went through seven different rehabs between 1935, like we were talking about. Seven, I didn't know that. Yeah, and 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 a lot of them relatively substantial. Um, some of them were you know slight modernizations, but a lot of them absolutely changed the space. So, for yeah. example, all the stonework downstairs, um, and all the woodwork was uh, painted battleship gray yeah. um, during the 60s, and there was a whitewashing of a lot of the woodwork and the rest of the materials throughout the space. Are you serious? And that's when they put in drop ceilings, that's when they put in the facade, um, and they took out a lot of the historic aspects. You're right, there's drop ceiling in the, in, in, yeah. in that in the video original. that you saw, yeah. yeah. And, and outside, the front, the whole facade of the building is like covered in this like metal grating. Yeah, there was an aluminum, I, I don't know if it was an aluminum siding salesman that hit the area. Um, <laughs> They hit Clifton's and, and rebuilt, and some of it was, was interesting. Um, it maintained a little bit of the sense of playfulness uh, that the original had, but it didn't represent what I felt was the, the most authentic, uh, most impactful, and most consistent vision of, of what Clifton's was. So, yeah. well, so was there a point where Clifton's shut down? Yes. When did it shut down? Uh, I, I shut it down approximately eight years ago. Eight years ago. Okay. Yes. To to, revet, to to renovate it to do yes. what you do okay, so what was the, what were some of those challenges to when to to revitalize it? Well, as far as I remember, I don't remember a giant tree in the middle of in the yes, middle of Clifton's. there wasn't a giant tree. Um, so you grew that and you just had to yes, wait for it. Though. We had to we <laughs> had to it. take 150 years to <laughs> <laughs> probably felt like 150 it, years. It felt like 2,000 years, which is probably closer to what the tree would be. Yeah, yeah. but um, the the sense was. Um, Originally, I had the idea of actually just doing it uh, while the place was open. Okay. Um, that fell the wayside awfully quickly, recognizing that, you know, the infrastructure was built in the, the like you were saying, around 1904 and 1906 originally, had been redone in the 20s, had been redone in the 30s, had been, you know, these seven different iterations. Yeah. Um, 
we were finding things like some of the drop ceilings weren't just one drop ceiling. Instead of uh, oh. replacing a drop ceiling, they dropped another ceiling below it. So you would have layer upon layer wow. upon layer of actual drop ceilings. Who, who thinks that doing a drop ceiling is a good idea? I the only I actually do at this point only because for the sense of restoration, usually yeah. they leave in place what was there. And they don't spend the money, they figure, okay, we can cover it up instead of tearing it out and replacing it, which means it's preserved, encapsulated, and you go, okay, they're going to do minimal, minimal damage to hang the new ceiling, and we're off and running. Wow. Um, but when they do three, you go, okay, I didn't realize there was one above that, and I didn't realize there was one above that, and you run into some issues. Um, likewise with some of the plumbing. Um, wow. You know, you had plumbing where, of course, I was expecting it to be old plumbing. Um, I've never seen anything of the nature that went on here. So if there was a leak in a pipe, they would put a bucket under it. And under that bucket, if that bucket started to leak, they'd put a bucket under it. So you had no. several, absolutely. And I, I it's funny because I took pictures of some of this stuff and I thought, wow, I've, I've just never seen. And I, I thought you were gonna say, just get a bigger bucket. <laughs> yeah, no, this was, it was so funny because you literally see the rust in the bucket that was beneath it. And instead yeah. of just even replacing the bucket, they just hooked another, you know. So wire. what you're telling me, Andrew, is that you had your work cut out for you. It was the most complex, challenging, difficult, unusual, fully integrated project I've ever seen and can possibly imagine, actually. You had literally between the historic fabric, the historic building, uh, assembly usages, downtown Los Angeles, restaurant hospitality. Yeah. Um, you had, yeah, work cut out for us. And just briefly, before we can, before we dig into the essentially the Clifton's rebuild, what are some of the other places that you have, that you have worked on and done in your past? Yeah, I, I did the Edison. The Edison, um, okay. And I did that one approximately 2007, 2008. Okay. Um, and I did a lot of smaller hospitality projects that were more as amenities for other projects I was doing. Okay. So, um, I've done a lot of adaptive reuse. So my my original concentration was. Uh, taking historic buildings, rehabbing, um, bringing them back, and doing as much restoration and complementary additions as, as possible. And the, uh, the Neverlands group, can you tell us about that? Yeah, the Neverlands is actually sort of a, a new concept. Uh, it's actually an old concept that's finally coming to fruition. The, the one good thing about the pandemic, if anything can be said about the pandemic, is it offered a, a new beginning. It, it sort of offered a reset. Um, I liken it to, you know, it's hard to um, fix an airplane while it's in flight. That it's, you know, rehabbing a 747 while it's in flight is not a wise proposition for any of a number of reasons. So if any of you out there are thinking about trying to fix an airplane while it's in flight, Andrew says it's not a good idea. Don't do it. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> Having tried that, um, Having the first thing is if you close down, then you sit there and you lose the business. But if you're forced to close down because nobody has a choice, it gives you a chance to reset and, and get a little bit of perspective and start doing the things that you wanted to do. Um, oh. And things that you also learned over the time. Yeah. I mean, you know, part of Clifton's, the, the whole endeavor has been recognizing what works, what doesn't work, making a lot of mistakes along the way, learning a lot of different things, yeah. and getting to the point where we can say, okay, I think this is the right version, but we need to implement it. Can you give us a couple examples of what you're doing in this reset? Yeah, it's, so the Neverlands is actually a really broad concept. Um, the Neverlands is actually the intersection of the real and the imagined. Mm -hmm. So all of the different places that I'd like to build and the places that currently exist, such as the Edison and Clifton's, are going to be sort of these intersections where you can actually be in the physical real world, the yep. bricks and mortar world, but you take a, a sort of a digital twin of that and you create a fantasy environment. And this will be the intersection where you can go between the two freely. Um, and there's things that we call interactives that are placed throughout the place, whether it's a jukebox or it's a radio or it's a projector or it's um, a telephone, it could be any of a yeah. number of different devices. Those allow you to interact with this imagined world. And so what we're already taking oh, within Clifton's yeah. as a fantasy environment, we're taking, making the digital twin of that and making it completely interactive and explorable from any of these venues. Awesome. Awesome. So it's a fun project. It's allowing the first step of it to happen now. That's I'm excited for people to wow. see yeah. and experience. So on these videos, uh, you know, uh, I'm along for the ride. But on my videos, I my the perspective that I share and Ray shares with the public is the um, controlled atmospheric environment, which is what a, a great tiki bar is. 
um, because you can control the rain or no rain, you can control the weather, you are not being authentic to the source material, but you're creating a fantasy land out of it. And you've used the word fantasy a couple times, which I'm just enthralled by. Um, and, and just what was your personal motivation to take on, especially the Herculean effort of Clifton's, um, and, and your, your, your thoughts along those lines? It's uh, initially, I, I had always seen, um, you know, I'd known Clifton's uh, for some time just being in downtown Los Angeles. Yeah. So I'd walked in, I had been absolutely mesmerized by, you know, both its history and just the fact it was still here um, in any form. And the fact that there was this sort of authenticity where you heard an echo of history and mm -hmm. you could actually walk through and experience the echo of history. So that, that felt very important to me. Um, after I had done Edison, Edison is uh, strictly nightlife. Um, so yeah. it's uh, 21 and over. And my feeling was that I, you know, when, when children are allowed there for events and whatnot, they respond wonderfully. They absolutely go, everybody turns into a kid and goes and explores and plays with mm -hmm. the interesting yeah. objects. and. Um, you know, becomes fascinated. So my idea was to find a location that we could do that with everybody and allow all generations uh, to interact and come and visit and discover and explore. So Clifton suddenly presented itself uh, as an opportunity where the original cafeteria was here with a lot of unused space within the building that had been storage previously, had been offices, had been a workshop. There used to be 11 Clifton's uh, locations. This was the hub, so the main office was here, the main commissary, uh, some of the main infrastructure for repairs and maintenance and stuff. So a lot of dead space in the building, and I thought, okay, if I take this space and am inspired by the original, where would I go with it? And strangely, I, I didn't know any of this going into this, so this, this became something that's sort of classic Clifton's to me, which is things have all these layers and as much as you dig, mm -hmm. the more you're gonna discover and find. And the more you're intrigued and the more layers it opens up that you had no idea even existed. So when I first got to Clifton's, um, the idea was, okay, I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna add some amenities, I'm gonna update um, and make it accessible yeah. um, and, and preserve it, which was sort of the key, keep this on Broadway, keep this for Los Angeles, keep this for the future. Yeah. Um, so taking that though, I suddenly started reading about Clifford Clinton and realized that he was an individual who came from Berkeley, moved to San Francisco, from San Francisco moved to Los Angeles, and in Los Angeles did this work. Strangely enough, I went to Berkeley, moved to San Francisco, oh. <laughs> and then came to Los Angeles and did all these things. And even on top of that, he was inspired by the same locations that I was when he was growing up. So oh, down oh, in yeah. Brookdale is an area that I knew as a kid going you with my parents. Oh, yeah. Yes. Definitely near Santa Cruz. Um, so I would go down to Santa Cruz with my family. We would go to, you know, or you'd go to Big Basin, or you'd go to Muir Woods, or you'd go to Yosemite. Mm -hmm. All of the, the stuff that inspired Clifton's originally was exactly what I grew up yep. with. Uh, home of banana slugs. It, home of banana <laughs> slugs, yes. And there's a lot of stories there which we don't have to go yeah, into. Yeah, yeah. Well. <laughs> but the <laughs> idea um, of being inspired by that, suddenly I said, okay, he was inspired to take something and bring it to downtown Los Angeles as, uh, you know, a respite. Uh, and a way to nourish the, the, you know, the body, you know, his idea was nourish the body with the food and then nourish the soul, the imagination and the spirit as well, yeah. which is why he created these environments. I felt the same way and I thought, what was I going to build based upon that? So I uh, took a lead from him and said, I'm going to do Yosemite and Muir Woods as the primary examples. Okay. So in the main area where I built the tree, um, one of the murals is Muir Woods and okay. the other one is Yosemite Valley. Oh, wow. Um, okay. And then the tree itself is based upon a tree in Muir Woods in Cathedral Grove, really? which is where the convocation of the United mm. Nations took place, really? and also the memorial for Franklin Roosevelt. So that's the centerpiece of the monarch tree, which is currently there. Um, and it's actually, you can go and visit the tree itself. It looks exactly like that. It's, it's actually about three times uh, the diameter, because mm -hmm. um, at some point we said we're not going to build the actual tree um, <laughs> no, and, let no, it, no. and let it grow for a while. So yeah, because those roots will too. those yes. roots will grow out over time. Yes. yes. So wait, but you 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 said something a little while back that so the, the so foot f um, like Clifton's was s essentially the, the it was smaller as far as like the spaces and the places that were open. Like yeah. you had the restaurant, you had the mezzanine. Yes. Was there more to it then? Yes. The cafeteria? The original, the historic area was the, the historic dining room, which okay. is called Forest Glen. Yeah. Um, and then it had the terraces around that, so yeah. sort of the second floor there. It had a back area of that, which was an overflow dining room, which yeah. was on the second floor. And then it had, upstairs, it had a couple of breakout event spaces, and it had um, what they called the Red Room, 
uh, which was uh, originally a furniture storage uh, and showroom. So besides those things, the building was mostly unused except for some offices upstairs. So, so there were basically three floors unused. And then in the basement on top of that, you had uh, storage and uh, the dishwashing machine. Yeah. So the so idea was really utilize the space that's here, make an environment that you can explore, make it so that we can take not just the forest floor and go up through the forest, but go beneath the forest floor and then go also beyond the canopy of the forest into things like yeah. the Pacific Seas. So my, you had raised something about family. Um, when um, you opened in 2000, Rio? 2015. 15, okay, I came in about 16 before Pacific Seas had opened. Um, and I came on a Friday afternoon and it was magical because there was um, a small Mexican-American family having a, a party outside the goth bar. There were um, some guys trying a new craft beer downstairs. There were people like me just gawking at, at the renovation because I was familiar with the old Clifton's. There were tourists. Um, and the cafeteria was magical. And you're probably tired of this question, but with the cafeteria and what are the plans for, the, mm. for food here? <laughs> Not so much tired of it, um, still formulating <laughs> the ongoing answer to it because the idea is Clifton's first and foremost was uh, not necessarily just a cafeteria, it was a dining establishment. So it was the first experiential dining location. Um, so it wasn't so much about the cafeteria portion, it was the fact that you do nourish the body and there are people here for a social experience which is uh, centered around food. Yeah. So that was extremely important and again trying to stay authentic to the original ideal that's what I've been trying to recreate. Yeah. Um, recognizing that when they opened originally in the 30s it was the middle of the depression and they had up to 300 workers in this single building that they were paying a dollar a day. So oh. they had a concept that was working in a very different environment um, than we're able to even yeah. contemplate now. So yeah. constantly reevaluating what the possibilities are um, and making sure that it's economically viable so that we're not looking at something that, that is wonderful for a very short amount of time and everybody says, yay, it's exactly what it was, and then it has to close because it doesn't work. And then conversely, when Pacific Seas opened, um, my wife and I came here like right at opening and um, came in uh, through the speakeasy entrance at the time and um, when the uh, maitre d' uh, or, or manager here she saw that we were into tiki she rolled out the red carpet for us and the experience was a different experience but this space was equally magical uh, as a tiki bar aficionado in the decoration it was terrific and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about working with Bamboo Ben and some of the thought process and homage to Clifton's Pacific Seas, the old bar that yeah. this bar uh, has today. Yeah, the idea was originally, so, you know, part of my original inspiration was the, the redwoods and, and the groves in Northern California. The other inspiration for me was similar to Clifford Clinton in terms of he went to Hawaii, he went to Asia, um, and he had these sort of grand trips that he took when he was very young. Um, and his was a missionary family, we were just going on exploration. But his started sort of this golden era of travel. And so I felt that um, fully inspired to just take uh, and explore the golden era of travel itself. And that served as the, the primary inspiration. And I knew, okay, um, you know, I've always been fascinated by tiki and, and trans-Polynesian and, and sort of Pacific Rim culture. So that being the broad inspiration, one of the things I did is I, you know, looked up um, who's the, the most um, authentic. And, and it wasn't a question of the best. It wasn't a question of the, um, you know, the most prolific or anything else. It was somebody who actually understood the authenticity and the history of Tiki and could take that and make sure we layered that into what we're building. And, and working with him was absolutely just fun. It, it's, to me, that's not work. He has, he has mm -hmm. made... He has built so many tiki bars over the last several years that I think for most people, when they think of like a, what a tiki bar is, they're seeing his work. Or at least that's mm -hmm. how it is for me. Like, mm -hmm. for example, uh, Forbidden Island, which was in, it's up in Alameda, 2006. Yeah. So, oh, that's a tiki bar. That's what it, that to me, that's mm -hmm. what a tiki bar looks like. What I love about Pacific Seas is. This kind of feels more almost, well, you have tiki's, so it's a tiki bar, but it actually has a pre-tiki feel. 
especially over here where, where you have the raised levels with the seating and that's how a lot of the pre-tiki restaurants were they're like for like dancing so you'd have these yes. large dance floors but then all the seating would be around but those all raised with a lot of bamboo yeah. this feels like a tiki establishment or a, a, like that would have been made in like like the 40s and yeah. also the art deco and incorporation was oh my god yeah i mean you it know it works so well that's why I, the, the idea was definitely to go back to uh, what uh, you know i guess everybody can discuss what authentic tiki is it, it's probably a useless term um but <laughs> yeah, uh, that's so, a whole other conversation <laughs> i think that's fair that's it a is. whole other conversation it's a, it's a can of worms it, exactly in the totally but, yeah totally yeah. different different question but going to an era of tiki um that they were doing the exploration themselves for the first time. Yeah. So that to me was what was exciting and what were they responding to and what was the world like when they yeah. were doing that. And so when Clifford Clinton opened Pacific Seas originally over on Olive. Yeah, that is on 6th, 7th uh, and Olive. 7th and uh, so Olive. Olive between, between six and seven, yeah. yeah. And here's the interesting right. thing. I mean, just show, I mean, I'm from Seattle, so I'm not from Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. The things that were all a little confusing for me is because anytime they've ever seen pictures of Clifton's it was that location with the waterfalls out front. Yep. And then I remember hearing about this Clifton's and I'm like, well, where's the waterfalls? At? You know, I didn't understand that this was a different building. Yeah. That I didn't understand that, this, that Clifton's was a chain. Yeah. Mm. And then I remember hearing about the Tiki bar here called Pacific Seas. And I'm like, no, wait, well, so. I'm glad that so the Pacific Seas name is 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 an homage to the original definitely Pacific Seas location. Yes, and and the Pacific Seas itself, this iteration is an homage to all past uh, tiki bars. A lot of them that can't exist, didn't exist uh, exactly. They sort of exist in our imaginations more than they exist in reality. Yeah, and also um, places that are just gone. Yeah. So, for example, Bahuka, um, oh, we Bahuka. salvaged a lot of uh, the elements to keep it together as a collection, and that's a lot of what you see, and. It goes back to, um, for most of these things, again, the authenticity. Yeah. So what you see here is as authentic as I can figure out how to make it. So when you're looking at a, a canoe, it's an authentic 100-plus-year-old canoe. Oh, that's, there's a boat right there. And, yeah, and on top of that, there's a 1935 Chris Craft that's the centerpiece of the bar, yep. um, which also happened to be the year that it opened. Oh, so someone, I, yeah. someone told me, Andrew, that you don't try to fix a boat while it's in the water going. <laughs> <laughs> yes, another mistake. I another that's, mistake that's, that you get. That's why this one's on the fourth floor now. What are some of the other bars that are here? I like the idea of having one location where you're basically exploring and you can find whatever it is that's going to yeah. suit your feelings because everybody, you know, nobody wants the same thing every single time. Yeah. As much as you can fall in love with a place, even if it's your regular place, you're not necessarily in the mood for the same thing every time. And, and most places that's a change of, you know, the band or it's a change of the drink, a um, little bit of the music, and that's kind of what, what you can change. Mm -hmm. Here, you can go explore and find your area that you feel comfortable and you find yeah. interesting. Um, and that goes throughout the space. So the idea was you're bringing um, yourself through the original Clifton's historic uh, okay. Forest Glen. So yep. all of the area that was restored to its sort of original 1930s era. Yeah. Um, as you go through that, that's the forest floor. Yep. And as you progress through the building, you go up through the canopy of the forest. Okay. And so you're going up through um, the base and into the, the bottom of uh, what I call Cathedral Grove. Cathedral which Grove, Which is the okay. Monarch Bar. The Monarch Bar. It's, and what is the Monarch Bar? Monarch Bar is, a, is much more a neighborhood bar. It's neighborhood very bar. accessible. It's always the one that's open. Um, and it has a, a lot of specific elements that pay homage to California and California history. Okay. And then as you come from there, you go up a, a little bit and you go to the Gothic bar. Okay. And the Gothic bar is a little bit more elevated, a little bit um, more um, interesting spirits. Uh, and it has a little bit more of an experience that's heightened, um, again, okay. as it goes up through the building. Um, Nate, what's the name of the Gothic bar? Or is that this, just the that, Gothic, the Gothic, Gothic oh, bar? Where, where the <laughs> what, should we, what should we call this Gothic exactly. bar? And where did the bar the come Gothic, from? It's no, no, no. The Gothic, Gothic bar. <laughs> But yeah, a T H E E. I, I ran out of creativity that day. I, I thought, okay, I, oh, it's <laughs> just perfect. Perfect. Andrew, what should we call this coffee bar? The centerpiece, uh. <laughs> the centerpiece, the bar itself. Where did that come from? That is just an amazing, a piece of art. To tell you the truth, it came from eBay. Um, which is a bizarre really? place to come from, but uh, a lot of <laughs> the exotic here, lands of the eBay. exotic yeah, lands, really. which I, I think it, it should be almost a commercial for eBay. What one can find on eBay? Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah I found a, a back cathedral from in Boston, um, 
that had been Sh- salvaged. You should in. say it the eBay. <laughs> Shipping probably costs the, as much the as the eBay stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, wow. Just getting somebody to figure out how to get it over here, um, yeah. and then having the guys here figure out how to reassemble it. Oh um, came in boxes of you know one to one hundred and sixty. You go, uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> I hope there's a direction somewhere in this box. Um, <laughs> and then, and then, we got Pacific Seas here, but there's another lounge area that's on this floor, but it's out of that. What is that? That's actually called the treetops. And the tree again, tops. Okay. A, a very creative name. We're at the top of the trees. What do we call this? Um, but that's actually it's. it's We're a, very literal <laughs> here. <at Clifton. laughs> so the treetops is an. A, Top of the canopy. Yeah. So a heightened experience, and likewise the spirits are rare spirits, fine spirits, yeah. and a much more, you know, this is the stepping off an embarkation point to yeah. more fantasy. So that's that's adjacent here, so that makes sense. And then we have Brookdale Ballroom, which is within what used to be the Red Room. The Red Room, okay. And that location is a nod to the past and history. If, if you walk by on any Friday, Saturday night with the swing dancing and whatnot goes on in there, okay. um, it feels literally like there's an echo of history even, mm. you know, and what I love is the fact that multiple demographics all congregate within Clifton's and multiple age groups. Um, everybody walks by and gets the same feel and want, is drawn into that history and wants to know more and explore and, and feel that. And here's the thing, I mean, I mean like, I'm not just into Tiki. Like, I'm into goth. I'm into these different, these other subcultures, too. And I, I'm sure there's people that are in the same boat here that will, you know, if I was coming here, I'd grab a, I'd grab a drink at the goth bar, the, the goth bar, mm-hmm. then come up here and have a tiki drink. Or I'm sure there's a lot of people. Oh, well, have you seen that? Like, have you seen the different, there's, there's different a demographic that's going to this bar, there's, then there's a different demographic going to that bar as opposed to this one. Or does it all mix and match? It all mixes and matches, which is what's wonderful. And I think one of the cool things about an environment like this is you're exposed to things that you wouldn't necessarily have gone out and seen and sought for yourself. So a lot of people would have never gone to a place where they're swing dancing. It wouldn't have occurred to them or they wouldn't know where it was. Um, And they go and they suddenly think we're introduced to this scene and now that sort of cross-pollinates and people start to explore and Mm. add that to their repertoire. Same thing of all of the different bars. So there are things that say, you know, whether or not you originally enjoyed things that were, um, you know, tiki. Yeah. Um, you may not have ever been to a tiki bar, but you ended up coming to Clifton's and you found that there's a tiki bar and you thought, oh my God, I just got exposed to this entire new world. Um, and that, that sort of inspires people to go explore other tiki bars, yep. which is really cool. And, well, I'll, I'll say this. Like, I mean, I, I lived in New York City for a couple of years. And what you do when you live there is you go bar hopping. But you'd literally have to, like, walk to the different bars. Yes. To go to these different, oh, they're all dive bars too. That's the thing. <laughs> but um, the thing that's awesome about Clifton's here is that you can go, you can go bar hopping, and you don't even have to leave the, you don't even have to leave the premises. That's exactly. Completely different environments. Completely different environments. Completely different programming, and the ability to have different nights. Uh, you go to Clifton's on one night, it's you, and you have an intimate night um, with one other person, by yourself if you want. You also can have a night where you go dancing with, you know, 400 people, or you can have a, a, a family dinner and bring people from out of town, or you can bring the family. You can do all sorts of different stuff. Right. So that, that to me is, is, you know, again, why I sort of went into this yeah. is to allow that kind of yeah. interaction. And, and you have a basement bar. What's the philosophy there? Yeah, that's the shadow box. Yeah. The shadow um, box. Love it. The long awaited shadow box that's been under construction for about seven years. Oh. Um, it, it's waiting for another tree to grow. Um, but, <laughs> So what it's what it's doing, um, that's beneath the forest floor. So okay. everything Clifton's is science meets nature. Um, there's a sensibility behind it that yeah. there's this uh, there's this wonder and mystery and beauty in nature, and this is where science truly meets nature. So it's yeah. the the alchemist workshop, um, and that's where you really get to explore the history of um, uh, of both Clifton's itself and. Uh, natural history um, and in addition to that scientific history as it progressed um, and it really truly explores that both in terms of its physical premise and, and its programming. We've gone through some tough times with COVID and everything like that and I honestly think we are going to see a more desi- people want to escape. I think people are going to need more es- they're going to need escapism more than ever and this is it. This is, I mean, if you want to escape, if you want to go into this world, you want to go into that world, you want to go into the goth bar, or, you know, you, can, you have options. And I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm blown away. And I think 
I think as time goes on, I think you're going to see a lot of people when they come to a place like this. So I'm, I'm blown away here. <laughs> Want to support the Tiki with Ray show and look cool doing it at the same time? Then head over to TikiWithRay.com and buy yourself a Tiki with Ray shirt. They're only $20. Tony Canepa did the design and they're screen print in America.